All right, so it is 2.05. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and get started. This is uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week. We are towards the end of the week uh, and have had a really awesome uh, week so far with lots of different programming. Um, I'm Katie Hammond, I'm the Executive Director of the Downtown Troy Business Improvement District, um, but we have had a lot of partners on this, um, on this week. So a huge thank you to Ignite You, some of you on the call, Bob with us today, um, Troy Innovation Garage, the Tech Valley Center of Gravity, uh, the City of Troy, Hack RPI, Agora Media, Russell Sage College, uh, collective Effort, De Facto Global, the Art Center of the Capital Region, and the Rensselaer County Regional Chamber of Commerce for being here, as well as Startup Grind for joining us for this conversation today. Um, we will go ahead and get back here. So today um, we have a full program ahead. Um, I wanna introduce our moderator today, um, Patrice Perkins from Startup Grind. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And um, if you have any other questions about Global Entrepreneurship Week, uh, all the recordings that have happened throughout the week are available at downtowntroy.org under the GEW page. So looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for getting us started today. Hey, Katie, thank you so much for that great introduction. And we're really excited uh, just to be here. Uh, again, I'm Patrice Perkins. I am the director of Startup Grind Capital Region New York. Um, for those who don't know, Startup Grind is a, a global entrepreneur community. We're the largest active uh, entrepreneur community. We are currently in 600 cities and 125 countries. And we exist to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs. So Katie, thank you so much. Uh, also, thank you to I'm the Rensselaer County uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, it's great to be here with this awesome panel. I'm really excited uh, for the conversation that we're going to have today as we talk about startup to operations. So I, first of all, want to just welcome the panel that's here. Welcome everyone that's joined us on the call today. Um, but I'm super excited. We've got Eva Rising from United Aircraft Technology. We have Richard Zack from Our News, and we have Bob Manasier, Robert Manasier from InFocus Brands. And so welcome to all of you. Um, I just wanna invite anyone who's uh, come into the call to feel free, jump into the chat. Um, if you have any questions, and we, we will about midway through ask for questions again. Um, but let us know who you are and where you're from and you know why you're here, why you stopped in, why you wanted to check out this particular event. There's a lot going on for Global Entrepreneur Week. So welcome everyone. So I think I'm going to go uh, traditionally and do ladies first. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with Eva. Uh, Eva and I, um, we met, uh, I think several years ago uh, through an Ignite You um, event. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to have an opportunity to really chat with you a little bit more about what you're up to. Um, from startup to operations, can you chat a little bit about, share a little bit about um, what brought you here? And um, into the, I know that's, that's kind of a story in and of itself, but the, the piece of jumping into not just entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship as a husband and wife team. Well, uh, thank you for the wonderful questions. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, and like you said, it's a hello story, but um, what brought me into entrepreneurship is uh, just the challenge of being able to build a product or a company surrounding a key issue that is important to us. Because for, in our case, for United Aircraft Technologies, a key issue is Darian's story of how God, he got injured because of the clamps. And having that passion behind it, be able to create the solution and be the best uh, spokesperson for it has been a, a key difference for me to go into entrepreneurship. Uh, even though I have some business background, being like, you know, in the ground running, uh, building and strategizing and playing different roles has never been like at the, at the same day, it's never the same. And especially as a husband and wife team, uh, it, it ended up happening that, of course, with, with marriage, uh, we complemented each other's uh, skills. He focused on the technical side, I focused on the business side, and that has helped us uh, have that key balance that has made us successful to this date, which has been a very key point when you we went from just an idea into actually executing an operations that is a, a huge step to take forward. So you're, you know, you said a lot in that, and um, thank you for sharing that information. Um, you, you actually, as an organization, you have not been around very long, and yet you've had some some real uh, leaps. Um, you've had some, um, you know, some experience with competitions, and you've been successful in um, 
what have you found, you know, as we, we, you are still very much a startup, right? And yet you are, you are, you are so all are also a company that is in operation um, and getting things handled. So what, what was one of the toughest things that you experienced um, in that journey? Uh, one of the toughest things I experienced in that journey is uh, the bandwidth. At, at the beginning, you have to do 110% of the work. Uh, long nights, uh, long process. And, and because at that point, you're validating your idea. So you have to put the, the, the 10 times effort. That was very difficult. But then from there into the part, now the, the part, oh, we have money now, great. But now I need people to help me. But I'm so used to doing everything myself is, is letting, letting go and letting other people take care of what I what normally took care of. That part was kind of hard. It's my baby. Don't touch my baby. It's my baby. So um, it took a process of, of letting go and, and uh, trusting the people that I am bringing in my team. I did my due diligence. I understood what they're bringing in and, and letting, trusting them to do the execution. And that has improved our efficiency so much that as if I just stay by myself. So one of the things also, not just a, a wife in a, in, a, in, a, in a marriage working with your husband, but you are um, really thriving in a field that is, could be considered traditionally a male uh, dominated field. So um, how has that experience been for you um, as an executive um, coming on board, coming into the, because you you handle the business side, you know, um, Darian handles the engineering side, the, the technology piece of it, but you have a very rich, strong uh, business background that started when you were in, in Puerto Rico and uh, continued when you were here. So talk a little bit about how that's been. Uh, at first it was intimidating because going into the, not only aerospace, but military aerospace, Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it was intimidating speaking to a panel of, for example, a panel of a few people from the U.S. Army going from generals to colonels. It was intimidating at first, and most of the times I was the only girl in the room. Mm -hmm. However, um, that doesn't mean I couldn't play with boys. <laughs> but the, the, the fact is, is that I was fortunate enough that as through networking and panels and events that I attended to, I got the chance to meet a lot of other women that were in the same field. I one from, was from uh, IDEA New York, uh, where I met Valerie L. Mutt, who back then was a director for the U.S. Air Force Small Business Programs. And, and now she's part of my advisory, advisory board. So uh, having those people join and in, in be of my guidance and see that they did it and understanding the balance of where I'm Puerto Rican, I'm friendly, I speak with my hands, but also being able to be serious when I need to be serious and stand my ground when I need to stand my ground. And, and it's still, I'm still in the learning process. You never finish learning, but it, it's been great to have those women. And, and hopefully um, once I continue, be some of that, be that person for somebody else that comes after me because I made it this far because of them. And, and that's been my experience thus far. So talk a little bit, it just I want to tag on to the tail end of what you said um, under under, you know, the thread that I hear is mentorship. You receive some great mentorship. And um, even as a relatively young startup, you already are turning back and saying, OK, this is what I have. This is what we're able to do. And even at this stage, I have some things that I want to uh, turn around and offer to others. How is mentorship? Yes. Um, for me, mentorship was a key feature of getting where I'm at today. I've, uh, a startup in this nature runs fast at all times. Uh, you have to. Um, and so lessons learned, the key, and I, I think I said this once, the key things I learned the most that were the most important for me came from other entrepreneurs and people that have done it before me, uh, but being one of them. <laughs> um, so for me now to be at that stage where at the early stage entrepreneurs entrepreneurs going through the same things i have to be able to to give back to them and be that person for them has been a great reward for me uh, especially I, I this year i was the uh, mentor for mass challenge and to see those people see myself reflecting them and uh, be able to to help them through the mass challenge process i have a, a couple of them be winners overall winners in the process made me understand the importance and the rewarding experience that it could be to to give back. So 
to them and they 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 taught me and I taught them and it's, it was a wonderful wonderful experience okay Eva, we are going to shift a little bit, and now I'm going to, uh, as I'm looking where I see you now, uh, hi, Richard, how are you? Thank you so much for being on our panel today. Um, it's uh, great to have you here, and you have a startup uh, called Our News, and um, you, you've got a very interesting um, and necessary perspective on uh, the information that we receive. I, I, I Actually, I shouldn't even say receive, I just say inundated, because we are constantly inundated with uh, with, and I, I use news with, with air quotes, right? Because I'm a journalist. Uh, and so I learned that you have this information and then you have this information and you share that information with the public and you're giving them the respect uh, that they are able to make their own decision. But that's really not what we see today. So Richard, if you would talk, um, let's go back a little bit, talk about how you, um, how you actually got involved with entrepreneurship and then also jump into how our news came to be. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. Um, yeah, thinking back, my I was talking with my mom last night, and she reminded me that actually my first business was when I was 12, and I was mowing our neighbor's lawns. Uh, so apparently, uh, apparently, it's something that uh, I wanted to do from an early age. But my first journey into entre entrepreneurship happened when I was 14 years old. I um, heard about this thing called the internet. I thought it was going to change the world and I wanted to be a part of it. But back in those days, you used to have to connect to the internet using a modem. And where I lived in Geauga County, Ohio, it was a long distance phone call. So uh, I was spending $2 a minute online. And uh, really, I founded my the first internet service provider in Geauga County, Ohio, so that I could get online. And what I found was is that there were hundreds, in fact, thousands of my neighbors in the county that also needed to get online. And so after a few years of my mom dropping me off at their house so I could set up their internet while she waited in the driveway, uh, the business uh, really took off and we uh, had quite a, you know, quite a few number of clients and I was ready to go to college. So I, uh, I contacted our, a couple larger internet companies in the area and was able to uh, to sell the company for for my first exit when I was um, when I was seventeen, and um, that experience was really great because I got to see and fail multiple times at everything I did while you know, while I was getting that uh, the startup set up. And I think my lesson, the lesson that I learned and what I would impress on everybody is, um, especially your first time around doing a startup, you're going to make a ton of mistakes, and that's part of the game. It's part of how it is, and the and it's actually something that. Uh, um, should be embraced, I think. Um, so that was how I really got started with entrepreneurship. Since then, I've done four more startups. I'm currently working on my fourth startup, which is Hour.News. And we're a software company that uh, is fighting misinformation online. And as you mentioned, there's a significant amount of it. So we are, uh, we've been very busy this year and uh, doing everything we can to empower both businesses and consumers to uh, to cut through it and to find accurate information. So you have a what I, I enjoy. I'm a, I'm a wordologist. <laughs> I love words, you know, anything with words, you know, um, and you have taken you've created some interesting uh, some interesting words that you use to describe some of the things uh, you actually uh, take the analogy of when we we shop and we have the option of looking at the label of something and kind of seeing what those ingredients are. Talk about um, our dot news and 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 some of those those phrases and and why you're using those. Yeah, you know what we found early on in our dot news and we've pivoted multiple times. We were uh, we were part of the Ignite You program a few years ago. Worked with Bob and others. Um, when I first sort of learned what a pivot was, I was kind of lucky in my first two startups, we didn't have to pivot, didn't realize how lucky I was at the time. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things we found, which was really interesting about information or misinformation online is that a huge number of people um, won't necessarily accept something as true if you or, or false if you kind of directly tell them that. You know, if somebody has a deeply held belief and all of a sudden um, a fact checker or anyone comes around and says, well, that's actually not true. Um, there's a lot of resistance to that. And so we thought, 
how, how, how can you break through? How can you break through the noise of all this different misinformation? And we, we found that, um, that in fact, this has been done before in a totally different space and that's with food and food labels. And if you wanna know more about what's in any food that you buy, all you have to do is flip over the package and look at the label. Now the label doesn't tell you if it's good or bad. It doesn't say buy it or don't buy it. It doesn't say, oops, you've gone over your daily caloric ca content. You can't buy this. It just- Darn. If only it would, but right, right. <laughs> it just says, uh, you know, here's the carbohydrates, here's the fat, here's the sodium, here's the vitamins, here's all the information you need. And it leaves that buying decision in the hands of the consumer. And so we thought, well, what if we took that same approach and applied it to news content, ultimately to all information online? What if we could build technology that could instantly attach a nutrition label to all content and in fact we have built that and it is called Newstrition. and Newstrition is a software product uh, it, it exists in a variety of forms mobile app browser extensions api integrations and essentially it does what i just said you take any piece of content and it automatically uh, figures out what should go on that Newstrition label it puts it in the label and then you can see it so it doesn't um it doesn't actually tell you hey, this is false, or hey, this is true. Uh, it says, well, here's what professional fact checkers said. Here's what the public thinks. Here's, all, here's, the, here's info about the publisher. Here's info about the sources. Here's all the pieces that we can assemble into that newstrition label. And we ultimately leave that buying decision. In this case, the buying decision of do you believe the information or not, uh, we leave that in the hands of consumers. So we feel that this approach is effective at getting, at helping people to uh, be able to look at all the information, make more informed decisions, be able to cut through some of the noise and do it in a really uh, nonpartisan way. So two things you said that um, I wanted to touch on. The first thing being, and this I think is really important. I always, when I have these conversations, I'm always thinking of the company that I'm talking to, the, the topic, the overall talk, of start, you know, start up to transition. But what I found is there are usually certain principles that apply kind of universally um, and you know we're going to talk to Bob in a, in a few minutes and, and one of the things I learned from Bob I'll just preface it by saying in the, the term of being industry industry agnostic right so um, and there are usually uh, principles um, facts things you talked about a pivot and um, you said your first couple of companies you were fortunate to not have to go through a pivot um, but that this company um, you had a pivot and and actually, in a, in a way, kind of your product is giving consumers an opportunity to pivot, right? So pivot from the mindset that you have. Um, so, so talk a little bit about, talk a little bit about that. That's, that's a very good point. Thank you. And I think I'm going to use what you just said in my future I, it's discussions. Already, it's already patented. It's copywritten. No. Uh, I'll get a, I, we'll talk about a license later. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a really good point. I didn't, you, you know, I think it's, it's very common for uh, part startups to pivot. And like I said, I think we were really lucky in the first two startups that we didn't have to. We, I didn't quite realize how lucky that I was, but the startups these days, um, you know, things move so, so quickly and the, the industry changes, the market changes, your clients change, the, the problem space changes, everything changes so quickly. Um, I'm actually thinking that the startup community may need to pivot away from the word pivot um, because mm. it's, it's almost just a state of being. And what you're really doing is you're, is you're, is you're determining your product to market fit. I mean, you're, you're iterating through the process of determining where can you provide the most value to the most number of people. And as you kind of go through that process and hone and hone that product down, um, you, you can tell if it's working or not. I mean, the question is, you know, are, are people, are you increasing your engagement rates? Are you increasing, uh, the number of people that are using it? Are you increasing the number of rabid fans that you have uh, or not? And if the answer is anything other than yes, then you, have, you still haven't found your product to market fit. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of the things that, that, that Ignite You impressed uh, upon me and that we've learned is just sort of this kind of, you know, idea of the iterative sort of startup approach. Just because your first idea doesn't work you know, or your second idea doesn't work, Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean almost anything other than you learned what isn't working. So now you can pivot to what is working. And as far as sort of the, the mindset of, of, of all of us as we consume news and information online, 
there is a, a huge pivot going on in the world. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the consensus of the, so of, of the experts is that uh, there, th 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 there's, there's no disagreement on what the ultimate solution to misinformation is. No one disagrees. The ultimate solution is for news consumers to make better decisions themselves. So how do you do that? Well, you know, we're all busy, right? We all read dozens, you know, people are news junkies like me, we read dozens of articles a day and we just, we shouldn't have to do a research project on every single news article we read. We shouldn't have to do that. So uh, we've identified that that's a big challenge that society's having. And that's, that's what we're trying to address is to make it much quicker and easier to do your own checking on any piece of content. And ultimately I think society um, you know, sort of used to be that um, there were three or four news networks that were largely in consensus about everything. And 90% of Americans got their email or got their news from those sources. Now we have this multitude of sources and so much information is available that we can't just sort of rely anymore on, um, on that, that structural consensus. We have to critically think about and determine for ourselves what's true, basically on every piece of content we see. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that and um, I, I give a little pushback maybe um, in that at a certain level, right? Um, we have a responsibility for what, for making things ours, right? So it's, it's um, I think we have, like you say, from that small uh, segment of, of trusted nude sources, right? And the, and the operative word being trust, right? And now that, like you say, there's this plethora of information that you can get it from your phone, you can get it from the internet, you can, um, but, but the word that comes to mind for me is discernment that there has to be a, a, a measure of discernment. We have a responsibility as people, um, what we bring into our eye gates and our ear gates and you know, allow, um, uh, so, so how are you, how is your product ascertaining? I know you're, you're using a bit of um, the process, I guess I'm asking. I know there's a bit of AI that's involved, but talk a little bit about what, you know, I'm a consumer, I'm interested in r.news. Um, what am I gonna get? What's, 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 my, what's my nutritional uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, gonna be? Well, and I think those are all very good points. And uh, what we did with the with the nutrition label is we work the nutrition label is we worked with uh, one of the largest uh, journalism organizations in the world, uh, who is who is now who has since no longer around. They were called the Newsium, and uh, we worked with them to uh, to to determine what are the most critical pieces of information that anyone would need to see to quickly fact check, check something. And what we quickly found is, is, is in fact, what fact checker, what professional fact checkers do, the process they go through is in fact what anyone should go through to determine the, whether or not they trust information. Um, but like I said, everybody doesn't have hours to go and do this on, a, on, a, right. uh, on an ongoing basis. So what the technology does is it, um, is it compiles information from a variety of sources and it presents it in the nutrition label. We use, uh, machine learning to look at uh, has any uh, has any fact checker has any professional fact checker checked this content or anything like it before and if so what were the results of those fact checks so in some cases you can see okay well PolitiFact says this Snopes says this factcheck.org says this or any number of the over 80 professional fact checking organizations out there you can see that all in one place instantly on any piece of content so a lot of our users find that to be very helpful, but you know, actually there's a fair number of people who don't trust the, the professional fact checkers, even if you have a consensus, right? Even if the top four fact checkers all have reached the same conclusion on any given topic, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're right or that people will trust that they're right. So we use artificial intelligence to gather even more information about the articles that, or the content you're looking at. Like, Who's the publisher? What's their track record? What other articles have they published? Who's the author? What's their track record? What's their information? What other content have they published? Where are they located? Sometimes that's really surprising when you see a publisher that looks completely credible and legitimate and you find out that they're you know, not even located in the United States or that they don't disclose. One of the most telling pieces for, about trust is simply do, do, does the publisher disclose 
who they are, where they're located, who, mm -hmm. who, who owns them, do, or do they keep it hidden? Do they disclose who actually wrote the article? Mm -hmm. so, um, so if you go to our website, our.news, there's no, there's no .com at the end or anything, just like r.news, you can see examples of, uh, of the nutri nutrition labels and the products free for consumer usage. The, there's a mobile app in the app store and browser extensions you can download, but you can see on our website some examples of uh, what it looks like and the content. Last point I wanna make on this is we, we believe strongly that there is junk food is okay in any diet as long as it's a healthy diet, right? Like we're, we're not saying at all that you should never consume junk food, just right. that you should know what you're consuming before right. you do so. Right. Richard, thank you. And we're going to, we're going to circle back around, but uh, I just wanted to kind of, uh, cause I want to, I want to just talk some more um, as we come back to you, but I want to come around to Mr. Manasir, Bob Manasir. How are you? Uh, and Bob, um, some folks may know Bob is the CEO of InFocus Brands, but he also is very well known uh, in the entrepreneurial community. Uh, he is um, a new venture manager for Innovate 518. Uh, he is the entrepreneur in residence for Ignite You. He is the entrepreneur in residence for uh, Sage. Uh, and so um, in his role uh, with uh, InFocus Brands, uh, started, launched, resurrected, exited 155 uh, companies, every continent except Antarctica. So I would, I would imagine Mr. Mr. Manager has a little bit to say about business. <laughs> so Bob, welcome. It's great to have you on the panel today. Always a pleasure. I'll try not to torment you too much, but it, it's gonna be tough. Um, Bring it you know, on. <laughs> you know, we, we um, you know, you have seen, had the opportunity to see companies soup to nuts, right? From the idea stage um, to, uh, you know, building kind of getting the culture established and, and discovering kind of who, who, who they are um, uh, to massive enterprises, you know, uh, Sony Music Label and, you know, Cargill, big companies. So you've, you've really kind of seen the gamut. Um, and, and so one of the questions is with startups, if we start at the startup side of the, of the spectrum, you know, when does a company stop being a startup? What, 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 what makes a startup and when, when have they graduated from startup, their startup wings? Yeah, so that's a great question because um, for our companies and our mindset, we never get out of the startup phase because for us and for anybody to differentiate between startup and business, right? A startup is looking for a business model. It's looking, as Richard said, to product market fit. It's looking to the target audience. It's all exploration. And until you find that match, you're in startup mode. So startup is in search of a business. A startup is not a smaller version of your future business. It is actually the exploration of business that classifies as a startup. And once you find that target market, that's gonna influence all the operations and all the systems you have to put in place because now you have paying customers. And the moment you have a paying customer, you're in business because now you have to start mapping out how to take care of that client. And, 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 and even Richard can talk about this. If somebody's paying you, it changes the relationship. And that's why we push all of our startups to get a client first. And the client could be in a pilot, right? It could be a test. We like paying customers, right? Because once that happens, we know what we're doing wrong. And I think that when I say my companies are always in startup mode is because we always think we're doing something wrong. So we build a feedback loop to stay in front of the market not to lag behind it. And I know the other people on the panel do the exact same thing. They're always in search. And I think that separates startups and then from established businesses. So I hope that answered. And Richard and Eva, you can always jump in. I'm not so, that exciting. So I need you to add some flavor. <laughs> you know, you, you said some interesting, you said some interesting things. Um, there, there is a mindset um, that, um, there was a mindset that, let me, let me back that up a little bit. I do want to still continue to live in this town after this panel is over. <laughs> there, there, is a, there, there are a lot of different programs that exist, um, um, incubators, accelerators, and things of that nature, um, where people present with an idea, or perhaps they have more than an idea, uh, go through a series of programs. Sometimes they're put on by academic institutions. Um, and there is no change. 
people will go through um, a, a, a program and they come out on the other side and maybe they've got a certification or a certificate or something. Maybe they have a business plan. You know, we can talk about the fallacy of a business plan. Um, and, and there really is no change. And I know, I, I guess I've been in the entrepreneur field now about six years and I've actually seen people kind of go through the various incubators and accelerators and programs. But if the key that we're, the key indicator that we're looking at is customers and a revenue that doesn't happen. And there is, um, there's almost a thought that, you know, we're, we're too soft on the, the startups that come through or the entrepreneurs that come through. We don't tell them soon enough, you haven't done, you know, you haven't kind of done the, the work or you've done the work and, and maybe you don't have a great idea. So anybody who knows my working style knows that's not me. I am brutally blunt all the time because I think it's a sign of respect. And, and this is not about anybody else's program, right? Because they're all well-meaning programs. They all have different reasons for existing. And I think your, your interaction with Richard about who takes responsibility for fake news applies here too. It's your business. So if you're letting somebody else dictate the course of your business that doesn't have a valid point or they have not lived it before, then it's on you, right? You can be spun around in circles for a long time trying to get everything right. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're starting a business, you're going to get nothing right. And don't assume you know anything. Right. Like you have to be in learning mode and you have to pay attention and you're supposed to fall down. It's when you get back up, as long as you learn something from that. You know, Richard's had to pivot a few times and I don't, the pivot's a word, right? It's, it's literally falling forward as our friend Steve says, Steve LaBelle, right? We're gonna fail forward. That's the important part of it. You can go in, a, you can learn something from every interaction. And now we're gonna talk, we talked about mentors and advisors. That's a two-way street. If it's a one-way street, that is not a good relationship for you as a startup. Even as you mature as a business, you want interaction. I want communication when Richard and Eva were in Ignite You, and to this day, we have conversations. It's not like I'm dictating anything to them because they are the people on the ground doing their business. They are experts doing that. My perspective is just a little older, a, little, a lot older, because I'm as close to dirt as possible. Um, <laughs> you said that, I didn't. I know Richard's turning 40 soon, so uh... I saw that note, thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> So I, I think two that's days. What you have to look for the, the honesty. And I think sometimes the programs are, are there to build confidence because a lot of people don't have confidence. But if you can't, if you can't survive somebody telling you you're wrong, then you probably shouldn't be doing this. And I, I would just also jump in and say, go back to the, this thing changes so rapidly. I mean, the lessons I learned 10, 15 years ago in the startups where I exited from are almost completely irrelevant now. And, and in fact, you know, uh, the things that I've learned and, and how things have changed in the last four years running our news, it's all completely different. I would never do it the same way now. It's almost like just it, things are changing so constantly and so quickly that constant learning is just, I just think is so important. And like, you know, how, that, how we used to do things or how somebody else did things. It's not, I'm not saying it's not important to know that or to learn from it, but it's just that what I trying to echo what Bob is saying is that ultimately it's up to the entrepreneur and it's you and you're the one in the hot seat. And you're the one who has to figure it out and make it happen. And the other part of it is, is, is going back into being, being brutal. Entrepreneurs need to develop that top skin. You know, you need to, to, to learn to hear a no. And I call it, ah, no, not for now. <laughs> that's how I call right. it. No, for now. <laughs> right. um, and that's perfectly fine because they all have their valid reasons. And if you take that feedback, not as an attack on you, but as a good chance to take a hard look at yourself. For me, uh, what I believe is that when we talk about the, the exercise with people, we always talk about the beginning, that area of the aha moment to the end, the successful exit. Nobody, hardly we talk about that middle part. Um, and when you are in that middle part or the valley of death or how you want to call it, that's where you really define yourself as an entrepreneur. The hard times come and you have to, to figure it out. And, and, and it comes in no matter what business you're in. And for me, for example, when I went through it, uh, my mentors 
and others seeing others understand that that happens or a book I read called the messy middle it was like a, bi a bible because it, it happens it's understanding taking a hard truth moments of hard truth and looking at yourself and seeing what do I need to improve of what is my, my inefficiency because that's what you're supposed to be doing as a business looking where your inefficiencies are and figuring out and then streamline streamlining it so being having a, an advice that's brutal like Bob, for example, I'll, I'll pick on him because he's here. Um, and and <laughs> having someone that's brutal, it's in the end, at the end, helpful. And that doesn't mean I was like, I'm not talking to Bob again. <laughs> it, it, but it's it's understanding. No, let me go to Bob. Let's see what he thinks. And, you know, but you still have to make your own decision and make your, but make an informed decision. And that's the, that's what you need to do. What, you know what you're what all of you are saying is really interesting because even with education when you're learning you know you can you can be in a in a learning situation a classroom setting and just have information you know just pouring in and pouring in that's not really where the learning takes place it is when you step away from that and you have that uh quiet time or the opportunity to actually have it in mo to, to really try it out that that is when you kind of get those aha moments that is when that that clarity kind of comes through so Thank you, um, thank you all of all of you for sharing that uh, that piece, you know that that insight. So, so we, we know we're we're talking about responsibility, having you know, uh, in pretty much in anything, right? Taking taking the responsibility for yourself, for especially for your own business. If it is your business, then you have to take the responsibility for for what happens, and that means you know, um, like from Richard's uh, perspective, you're weighing the balance. You're not just receiving things and just accepting those things uh you know as the gospel you really are um uh so so that brings me um bob to how are you as a as a you know there, there are folks uh here that are listening and folks that will be listening uh later how how can one um you have an idea you've got a, a new business um how do you how do you find those uh again with richard trusted how do you find those trusted um uh how do you discern balance how do you figure out kind of what you're getting if you're if because if you're new to business maybe you've been an employee and now you're starting a company you don't really kind of know how can one begin to kind of get that sense of discernment you have to look and be brutally honest with yourself and, I, and we do this all the time in cohort right we talk about what you love to do what you're great at and what you suck at or you, what you don't want to do and i always use the example i hate paperwork I've always hated paperwork. I'm not good at it. You give me paperwork, it's to sit on my desk for a while, right? I just don't like that part of it. So you have to look internal first to see who you really are and then find people that fix everything that you're not good at and put them around you. And you're going to make mistakes, right? A lot of startups and small businesses hire people incorrectly, incorrectly at the beginning. That's very typical. That's why we always say do everything as a phase or a pilot approach to hiring. Put some kind of, you know, trial period in place because you eat, both sides don't know if it's a good fit. And it's really hard as a startup to know what your culture is, to know what your team makeup is. So look inward and don't hire people or put people around you that think your way. Uh, Bob's advice here has saved us so many times. Okay. I mean, getting the right people on the bus is so critical. But being and but being able to get the wrong people off of the bus can be <laughs> so hard. So yeah. we we always like with our co-founders. We right now we have the best co-founding team I think I've ever assembled in any company, and it did not come easy. And there were a lot of failures. But one thing we did, per Bob's suggestion, is there was we build in sort of a 60 day mutual back out period in any co-founder relationship where either side can back out for any or no reason in 60 days. It basically gives you 60 days to figure out if it's gonna work. And boy, is that helpful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and from the two sides, having somebody join you that's going to be a good fit for what you are is ever so much important. It affects the entire chemistry of the team, the entire uh, pro uh, work work scope that you have. And you and I've learned those lessons the hard way too. It's having uh, a set time of like a trial period, making sure like we're going constantly going on dates here, making sure we're a fit for each other. 
Um, and the same is the same uh, about looking internal yourself, the areas that you suck at. Because as, as, as an entrepreneur, you you sometimes say nothing is ever perfect for you. So understanding what, what, what areas do I need help with and seeking out those people that can fill that spot. But the, the, the important thing is here is I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs and I've been guilty of it myself where I want to go fast. I want to go there. I want to do it now. But it's giving yourself time to meet and really understand that person. That comes for founders, employees, advisors, uh, investors, whoever it is comes into, you need to really know them and them, they understand you, you understand them. And that will make such a great relationship and so much a better for the, at the end for your business. It's, it's interesting what you say, Eva, um, there can be, I, I have seen this, um, the, the, there's almost a concept sometimes with newer businesses, especially ones that have not had other, have not either been a part of a startup or have it their own startup. I just have to go. I just, I just have to go fast. And if we, if we use the analogy of a, of a car, if you get in a car and you put your foot on the, the pedal, you absolutely are going to go. But if you don't have some sort of direction, you are going to more than likely at some point hit a wall, right? You're going to, you want to go and you want to go fast. And that's a common thought. Um, there's almost, Bob, the idea that activity equals progress. So I, 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 I'm looking at the time. So I wanted to say that, I wanted you to speak on that, but I also want you to talk about operations and how, how does, what's the best way for, you know, for a company to, to build that out. People are obviously key, but the actual operations of, of how, what makes it go and I'll, I'll, I'll do very quick answers because I think we want to hear the different perspectives of Richard and Eva too. Yeah. All right. So the first part is about relationships, right? That was your conversation. Like, I think everybody has to get into the mindset that you're building relationships as a business owner, or as an entrepreneur, whatever word you want to use, it's the power of who you know. Mm -hmm. It's the power of your network. And that doesn't mean numbers. That means quality. Right. Right. I consider everybody that I'm looking at because everybody else blocked them out as family. Right. Because we've been through the trenches together. We've done the grind. Right. We've put the time in together. And then over time, you build a relationship and, and everybody should be looking toward that. It's not a transaction. You don't right. get an advisor for an hour and think you're going to get anything worthwhile on either side. So I think that's that's something that everybody has taken into consideration when they're doing startups or they're trying to scale their company. Don't look at it as a transaction. But the other thing is hold everybody accountable to metrics. Like activity does not equal a good business, right? You need to set results. And, and a lot of times you're pivoting, and I'll use that word, because you're not seeing the results you need to keep the company going. And right. for us, we always build operations around that interaction with a paying client. Because you think you know what your business is going to do. And then somebody shows up, gives you money to do it, and they want it done a different way, or your system isn't keeping them happy. So obviously you have to make sure you're delivering them the best value, but also in a manner that they're comfortable with and that you've set the expectations. So operations for us, every time we start building operations, it's from the paying customer perspective. If it's an existing company looking for operational excellence, it's actually going through it as a paid customer to experience it and see where all the holes are in their process. And now I'm going to shut up and let the other two very smart people talk about their process. I can, I can go ahead because I've been going through the trenches on that myself. I uh, have the, the great opportunity to have somebody uh, join me to help me map everything out. But I think for me, it first begins, like uh, echoing a little bit what he said, I'll keep it short, uh, begins with the customer. Um, having a good relationship with the customer, a good repertoire, uh, would definitely improve how you set up for operations. For us in the helicopter industry, um, especially in the military, it took a while because it, it takes a second to get them. But once you have them, if you, it's not a transactional really, uh, a relationship with them. It's, a relation, it's like a building, a communicated uh, relationship with them that help us understand what their needs are. And based on that needs, because they're the ones getting the, the, our product, right. uh, we can set our operations. But it, with things we learn, it's the same that Bob said, activity does not mean that you're being efficient. Um, it's, it's setting up, sitting down, setting a metric, say down a goal, 
and then establishing tasks that's going to get you to that goal and uh, holding everybody accountable for it. Um, it could be, depends on, it could be a bi-weekly for us, it's a weekly basis. And I hold everybody accountable. And I always have a middle of the week, a uh, catch up time. How is this going? If there's any inefficiency, because it depends, some people are maybe afraid to say something. If there are any inefficiencies, having the team be open to say, okay, I'm having trouble with this here. Okay, let's, let's, let's figure that out. Let's iron that out. Let's, let's prove that out. And uh, once you have that set schedule to me, you know, oh, hands off, I'm perfect now. It's always be, uh, we always need to search. You always need to keep an eye out to see if everything are being followed accurately. Um, and it's not, it's not like a, a perfect thing that works for everybody. It's not cookie cutter. Everything's going to be different. But if you find that what works for you and your team, it, it's incredibly important. Richard, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo everything uh, Bob and Eva said. I think is 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 very accurate. Um, but I also really like the car metaphor, Patrice. Uh, you know, and and putting your foot on on the gas pedal. If you if you think about it, um, your 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 um, your 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 pitch deck, your business plan, your sort of your design of the company. Right. You know, you're, you're starting a new business, you have an idea and you got it, you do all this research and you start designing it, you start putting it together. Operations, it's, that's, your, that's your car that you're building and your map as far as where you're trying to go, okay? The minute you get in the car and push the gas is when operations start. And, and I would echo with Bob, that's almost always when there's a client you know, or, you know, whatever you define as a client, it could be a, a trial, it could be, uh, in some cases, it could be um, a user of your software, for example, is common. Um, it could be, you know, an actual paying client, it could be a partnership, it could be a variety of things. But whenever there's an outside transaction that's starting with somebody in that space, now the now your foot is on the gas pedal, and now you're moving. So by the po- time you get there, uh, you know, I, I like to hope that we have our, our cars in good working condition, um, you know, that we have our seat, seat belts on, that the map is accurate, but it usually isn't. Uh, and while we're driving, then we have to turn around and fix all the stuff that we thought was right about the car, but wasn't. I mean, I'm driving this car down the freeway going 70 miles an hour, and I'm changing my oil while I'm driving it. You know, I'm changing flat tires on the exit ramp, you know, in between, on my lunch hour. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm updating the map in real time because the roads are changing while I'm on them. So I think if you look at it that way, there's a certain period when you start your company where you're designing the car and you're plotting the map. And then, then at a certain point, you got to start moving. Rubber hits got to hit the road. You push down that gas pedal and you're moving. But the planning doesn't stop then. But now you're into operations. How can I more effectively get from point A to point B? Is point B really where I want to go to? Am I properly servicing the vehicle? Do I have a team of people who can service it for me? Um, And ultimately, operations all just comes down to delivering value to your customer. So I I like the car metaphor. I might have butchered my explanation of it, but I, I, I like I like that metaphor. And I think uh, I think it makes a lot of sense with any business in any industry. Um, and I see there's a question, so I'll chime in for one minute. How do you know when an idea has hit, has hit a dead end? That is a, that's like a a question on every startup entrepreneur's, uh, mind. And in my mind, it's hit a dead end when you've decided that it has. And, and, and the reason is actually because of this comment I just see in the chat, recalculating route, right? Look at it like a GPS. So all right, fine. You're, you're trying to get from point A to point B and you're off track with your idea. You know, do you give up and go home or do you recalculate? I think that's a, you know, a very interesting perspective in, in light of the situation, the current situation that we're in. Right. So um, during this pandemic, you know, um, dating Rona, as I like to, to call it, we really so many companies we're seeing um, some are able to um, I would say that the companies I, I, that have gone through the process of discovering who they are, their customer discovery, their product market fit, are the ones that have had a, a better opportunity to, if necessary, pivot. 
right? Those are the ones that, because you, you, you really can't pivot if, you, if you've never gone through the due diligence to figure out who you are. And so we've seen some surprising things of companies that have you know risen some companies you know I I interviewed a woman recently who actually has created you know a company uh, during the pandemic um, and again she wouldn't have been able to do that had she not already established um, this this almost laser focus of who she who she was who her target was and based on the the changing landscape able to okay now what do I serve to this to this landscape that's here that's here now so. Just, um, <laughs> Ashley says, absolutely, if you can't go through the door, go through the window. So we're, you know, we've, we've got uh, a little, just a little bit more time. I, I'd like each of you just to kind of share, what would you like to leave? And we've got, you know, we don't know exactly who's in the audience. We've got a, a variety of folks that are here. What would you like to leave um, our audience with? And Bob, I'm actually gonna start with you this time. What do you want people to walk away with today? Rookie mistake. First time on Zoom. <laughs> uh, I want everybody to know there's a, there's a lot of resources out there mm -hmm. to, to kind of get your bearing if you're lost, if you have questions like, when should I stop? Because there is a time when you should just put it to bed for a while, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it goes back to passion. But, you know, Innovate 518 is a great umbrella organization. Ignite You, Small Business Development Center, SBDC. I mean, these are all regional but they'll also point you in the right direction depending on where you are. So I would reach out to those resources because they're all free and they might give you part of that roadmap that Richard was talking about. At least things to think about that you might not have thought about. I think that's probably the most important thing. You're not alone. We've all been there numerous times and, and just start inserting yourself into the community. I know it's harder now with Corona that there's not live events, but I think it's easier now to get in touch with people because we're all stuck to the computer 24 hours a day. And I know where they all are. They're all home. So I can <laughs> go knock on their door. So, Richard or uh, Eva, and um, I do see we have another question that we can ask, but if you guys want to piggyback on what or you know respond to what Bob says, and then I'll ask the question after. I can I can do so, and also also answering that question that happened about what's the best operational tech. Um, it's streamlining all of it, like try to get your CRM and your uh, task all together. Uh, Richard, I think pointed out a couple of very good ones. There's another one uh, that I learned called Soho that has all of it integrated into one. That uh, mm -hmm. as well as your all your billing. Just right. as as an FYI, I'll put it in the chat, but. Um, in regards to like parting words, um, it's, it's hard, you know, it's hard sometimes to go through the process to have those hard truths. Uh, but once you do, I think it's going to make you much better entrepreneur, much better business owner or however you want to call yourself. And it's reaching out to those, like Bob said, reaching out to those, those business or those programs that are there to help you figure it out. Whether it's it should, you should put it to bed, because I agree there's some ideas you need to put to bed because it's just not working. But first, you need to make sure you knock on every door and you check every window and you jump over the fence if you have to. And until you, then you said, okay, I did everything that I could. I don't think this is going to work, or at least maybe it's not the time for now. Let's put it to bed for now. Because the one thing that I don't want any entrepreneur ever have to ask themselves is what if? Mm. Because that is, a, that is, that's going to haunt you. And I, that's speaking from experience, it's going to haunt you for a very long time. Do everything that you can in your power so you don't have to ask yourself, what if? And to do that, you go to those, those organizations or to other entrepreneurs and just shout, don't stay in your bubble. What is the worst they're going to say? No, but that's okay. You try. So it's just put yourself out there. Although it's scary, put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll toss the question up. Uh, what technology systems have you used that allow you to optimize your business ops? And um, Richard uh, put some things into the uh, chat, some of the systems that he's found helpful, Slack, LastPass, DocuSign, DocSend, Google Analytics, and yes, there are so many more. Um, and Bob mentioned some. Um, Eve, I don't know if you had some, some faves that you uh, are thinking of. Um, yeah, I was putting them in, in, in the chat and oh, okay. I agree with, with, with Bob. It's like, it should be 
something to help you not to give you more work. It, it should it should be to help your work, not to give you more work. Yeah, right. don't use any of these software programs until you're already at the point with like spreadsheets that you're going crazy. Because otherwise, like, there's no need. You know, if you reach that point, then you know you need some kind of tech. But like, don't definitely don't go up and sign up for the latest buzzy tech that's supposed to help startups because it's almost always going to hurt you or be a sure. distraction. You know, like. Do, do it the old fashioned way until you just can't do it the old fashioned way anymore. And then look at the, then, then look at the, the tech that would help. Right. All right. I, I, I second what you said about distractions because they can really be as you're trying, well, I've got this new thing and it's going to make everything great. And by the time you get it onboarded and realize um, that it really isn't helpful, but it, it served to pull you away from the hard work of actually digging in and, and th that deep inner searching that you need to do that, uh, you all have talked about uh, that discovery process of product or, or customer fit. Um, so, uh, Bob, you you left us with that. Um, Eva and Zach, I just I Richard, I've been wanting to call you Zach. I know that's your last name. I okay. I, I was having this conversation with Katie earlier, so I'm, I apologize. No um, is there anything that you would like to leave our oh. viewers and listeners with? Well, th th thank you. I'll try to be brief. I'm just going to say I truly believe that this is the best time to start a startup probably ever in human history. And I'm going to leave another, one other positive note and say, um, you know, this pandemic is hard, but entrepreneurs aren't stopping. And this pandemic is going to end. Where, where, mm -hmm. are, where my question to, to, to the entrepreneurs out there, my rhetorical question is, when this thing ends, where are you going to be? And what are you going to be doing? And mm -hmm. if you can stay laser focused on that, you'll be a good place. That's my final thought. Okay. I want to thank you, all three of you so much for uh, joining me today and giving me an opportunity to ask some questions. And I hope that this was helpful to our, uh, our attendees. And I wanted to remind you all, uh, this is, you know, it's Global Entrepreneur Week. And um, the, the Troy bid has been doing quite a bit of, as many organizations have been quite a bit of programming and you can find out um, some recaps, some things that have been going on. If you go to their downtowntroy.org, you can follow up on what's happened during the week. And it also a reminder to shop and dine in Troy. Don't forget to shop and dine, uh, help our local small businesses. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you all so much for being with us. The panel, thank you very much to the panel. And thank you all for taking time out of your day to spend time with us. Take care. <laughs>